about today is based on uh, my second book project, I hope, uh, called Backwardness and Rushing Forward. And, and um, I'm, I'm very interested in the age of speed. If you know some of my, my prior work, uh, there's a chapter in my, in my, my first book about uh, planes, trams, and automobiles and the dangers of people uh, getting struck with these new machines, but also adapting very quickly, at least in the case of the electric streetcar, to having the new technologies on the road. And uh, so that really got me interested in, in another way that we can think about um, the experience of modernity. And, 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 and I think anyone who, who takes any of my classes knows that I'm very much taken with Eric Hobsbawm's idea of the dual revolution, that is the French Revolution and the Industrial Revolution, and, and sort of the way that uh, it radiates from its, its dual epicenters uh, across the world. And what makes Central and Eastern Europe so compelling for me is the fact that they are, <coughs> I think, part of the, the first wave. So they're not the source of these new innovations, but uh, they're part and parcel of this civilization. They participate in it. And how then, is my big question, do people experience rapid urbanization, rapid modernization? So in this case, I'll be looking mainly at airplanes. And I found some absolutely wonderful crackpot sources uh, this summer. So that's, that's what I'd like to, to share with you today, primarily, is these, um, these sources. Is this a new kind of history, crackpot history? Crackpot history? I don't know. I think people have been doing that for a long time. Uh, so, um, I think you, one of the things that makes automobiles and airplanes so compelling for me is that people can imagine themselves as a sort of rapidly moving forward, right? I mean, you, you literally move forward, and, and perhaps this is a way that you can uh, compensate for being backward. And backwardness and forwardness, these are the metaphors that, that I seek to, uh, to play with, and I think that people were aware of at the time. Edmund Lebanski, a Polish engineer and tireless promoter of aviation, said in 1909, we don't want to remain in the rear, looking on with folded arms as other nations roll along the road of the future. Rather, we desire to work alongside them in the discipline of aviation. And who knows? Our efforts just might tip the scales of our fate. And then I ask, what better way to escape backwardness than in the seat of a machine rushing forward? Uh, this image is not coming through uh, very well in, in this format, but, but there are shades of gray. You can see the, the trees and the fields on the, on the hillside. But the stuff in white is what matters, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, this is pretty evocative of my title. Uh, so you've got... Um, and, and there's nothing wrong with this. A horse is actually the, the, the very best technology. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Thanks. A horse is, is the very best technology probably to get this glider up the hillside. And, and, yet, and yet it really encapsulates the, uh, the, the issue, I think, that I'm trying to explore. So I'm going to look at, at three examples. Um, one, that uh, sort of the way that a 19... 12 publication described early efforts in um, glider technology by a, by a Polish uh, innovator by the name of uh, Czesław Tyński. Um, then I'm going to look at uh, uh, this amazing journal from 1884 that was for a joint stock company, which want, it, it was centered in Lemberg, uh, or, or Lviv, or Lviv. And it wanted to um, promote aviation as early as 1884. And the name of the journal was Aeronata. And then I'm going to look at um, this amazing, uh, eccentric, uh, egotistical, uh, megalomaniac, uh, Jan Ostashevsky. Uh, I'm sorry, Adam Ostashevsky, who claimed to invented, have invented several airplanes before the Wright brothers or, or Farman or Blachigio. Um So, let's begin with the, the first example. This is of um, this publication, Samochut i Płatowiec, that came out in 1912. It was affiliated with a specialty magazine, Lotniki Automobilista. So Lotniki Automobilista could be translated as airman and automobilist. Samochut i Płatowiec, more properly as sort of automobile and fuselage or automobile and aircraft. And so 
Um, here you'll note something that I, I find quite particular about people who live on the periphery of this first wave, and that is that they're colonized by the companies from the center. So Continental is a brand that I saw all over the walls during the World Cup this summer, right? It's a German tire maker, and they also made the fabric that was used in uh, these early airplanes. And so here on the cover of this, this book, which is supposed to be more or less well, a section is sort of telling the history in general of automobiles and airplanes, and then there's a section, uh, the section that I'm going to focus on, that talks about the history of automobilism and aviation in Poland, and yet they, they're, sh they're shilling for their, for their uh, advertisers right here on the cover. Um, so, Samochód i Pratowiec claimed in 1912 that Polish aviation was begun in 1898, with the creation of a small aviation circle in Warsaw, composed of just three members, Czesław Czajnski, Julian Łukowski, and Władysław Kocet Zielinski. In 1896, Czesław Czajnski began the construction of his glider. The first trials of the glider began in 1898, undertaken in the Szczytce province by the three named above. The trials were to a certain extent, extent successful, the booklet opined. What they lacked most was an appropriate terrain. Yet Tynski, who was an artist by training, actually lacked the technical knowledge to create a truly practical glider. Even if several of his glider designs contained elements that were genuinely innovative for their time. Early in the new century, Kocent Jelinski, another of these three, uh, who was working on an uh, ornithopter, held a lecture on flight in Warsaw that attracted a large crowd, but, quote, unfortunately nothing really came of it. Uh, Samochód i Potowiec concluded that despite the fact that these early efforts in developing and promoting aviation largely disappeared without leaving a trace, this only testified to the difficulties of innovating in the Polish context. Quote, the mere fact that there was a group of people involved with aviation still in the era before Lilienthal's experiences testifies to the initiative of Polish thought, the publication noted rather misleadingly since Lilienthal died in 1896 the year mentioned as Tynski's first glider flight in the piece. The difficulties that these pioneers had to face were against were a hundred times greater than those in France and Germany. The fact that such rationally undertaken efforts came to nothing testifies to this. So this is their effort to explain, look, the conditions were much harder here, therefore the fact that we merely had people out there trying to build gliders says a lot about our sort of plucky Polish spirit and, and our innovative uh, attitude. So. Um, I think that this is a common sentiment, not just in Poland, obviously, but anywhere that, that people try to view aviation through a uh, national lens. Early enthusiasm rarely met with success, and Polish aficionados of aviation before the Great War had to content themselves with being followers rather than innovators. Okay, so that's the first example. Tynski, uh, he, he deserves to be known, I think, in, in sort of aviation history, but uh, Lilienthal is more successful and, and consequently better known. All right, here's my second example. This is Aronata. And so I, I saw that this, this uh, journal existed in the archives in the Stefanik uh, Library in, in Lviv. And I'm so grateful for your assistance in getting me into the library, Alex. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, so it was with great anticipation that I, that I first opened this journal. And it took me several weeks to fully comprehend what I had seen there. Um, I, I took photos of it, I took notes, but it really wasn't until I was writing a talk uh, for the Hall Center that I completely grasped what this uh, joint stock, and I don't even want to claim completely, but that I grasped what this joint stock company was really all about. So it, it was uh, published in 1884 by the uh, A Aeronautical Association Joint Stock Company for Aviation Industries, a great 19th century business name. Uh, the company was headquartered in Lemberg and Kolomia, with subscribers from throughout Haps the Habsburg province of Galicia, and within a few years from all over the world. Early investors included ordinary citizens, such as law students, uh, high school teachers, civil engineers, mechanics, professors, postal clerks, railway workers, among others, while most of the eventual international subscribers were newspapers from all, from all over the world. And so you he, see here, um, you know, a train engineer, a technical uh, worker, a teacher, 
a postal worker, a teacher, a law student, a private teacher, teacher, etc. So these are ordinary people. Uh, they're all men, and they're willing to join this joint stock company, which claims to promote aviation. Um, the investment, any investment greater than 20 crowns, entitled one to a vote on decisions as a shareholder. The first issue claimed that aeronautical transport was a good investment because overpopulation would make land transport increasingly difficult. The journal encouraged the use of a motor with a balloon or perhaps a winged machine to achieve flight, noting that just as fish ply the seas and birds and insects ply the air, there was no reason that people could not also use motors to create flying machines. Well, within a few years, they seem to have given up on the aeronautical and tended to focus more on the nautical as the source <laughs> of their income. <laughs> so, uh, the, this graph here uh, shows basically population density, so how densely populated uh, Europe, Asia, Africa, America, and Australia are. <coughs> and it, it's sort of using this new language of science that's such a big deal in the 19th century, and statistics and numbers and figures, to try and argue, a, a, well, I guess a somewhat compelling point, particularly from an overcrowded place like Galicia, uh, that there's space there, and why not, why not try to use that space productively? And it really seems that the editor of this journal was really obsessed with, with overpopulation and, and, and density of space. So, so he, he devises, or, or members of the company devise, these amazing boats that remind me actually of those um, uh, cloud seeders. Have any of you seen those that are supposed to sort of help with global warming? You see these fantastic machines. The, the illusion's not helping. Never mind. Forget it. <laughs> so here's a, here's a boat uh, that is supposed to siphon up the water of the ocean and sort of uh, dispose of it in other places so that you can reclaim uh, surface area from the ocean for your own purposes. And look at these astonishing watercolor maps. I mean, they really blew my mind. I, didn't, I, I, I really didn't even understand them the first time I looked at them. First of all, it was the period of the Gulf spill this summer. And so if you recognize this, this is the Mississippi watershed here. There's uh, Florida, right, and, and Mexico. So I just couldn't stop thinking of that. Um, but then I realized that what they were trying to do is reclaim land. And so here, the idea was that they would um, sort of give Europe more space by flooding parts of Africa. <laughs> so, um, In articles full of complex calculations accompanied by illustrations of his astonishingly arrogant plans and the machines that would bring them about, editor Piotr Majewski sought nothing less than to change the world, or at least convince ambitious if gullible investors to risk their capital on a truly revolutionary scheme. From its modest origins in Lemberg and Colomia, the Aeronautical Association Joint Stock Company for Aviation Industries Imagine a world where the sky offered car space for cargo routes and distant seashores could be altered at will, both subject to the tremendous power of the machine age. Considering the fact that overpopulation was a major concern in Galicia at this time, and that its major export was people, it perhaps should come as no surprise that such creative solutions arose here. And I think of um, uh, Alison Flight Frank's wonderful book, Oil Empire, about uh, the failure of the oil industry there, but also her argument basically is that it was wildcatted out of existence. And so you can see that people had innovative ideas, they wanted to try and raise money. Um, they weren't very practicable, uh, at least in this case. Uh, okay, so